guys. Welcome to No Walls. As you can see, everybody's not abiding by the studies <laughs> are being obedient. Welcome to No Walls. This is my first people, never in front video. Of the camp. So this is going to be a new experience. Um, again. <laughs> Hi guys, welcome back to No Walls. I'm so excited to have each of you worshiping with us today. Happy Sunday goes out to my young adults, college students, and to my sailors, and happy Wednesday. Goes out to my littlest viewer who continues to watch No Walls every Wednesday. And I don't know if she's my littlest viewer anymore, so, but still, happy Wednesday <laughs> to you. Um, God has really been good. He has been moving. He has been opening our eyes. Um, and so I just wanted to just do the Word of God today. Um, and I think this is important because it is what we know as Palm Sunday, also known as the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ. Um, we call it Palm Sunday because um, palms were laid um, as Jesus was um, being carried into Jerusalem on a donkey. Um, and we call it the triumphal entry because this is the beginning of his march um, toward laying down his life for our sins. Um, and so um, I'm going to read our focus scripture for today. It comes from Luke uh, chapter 19. It should be familiar um, to you. Um, and it just says, uh, Blessed is the king. This is uh, chapter 19, verse 38 through 40. 19, 38 through 40. And it says, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. If they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And so um, I'm going to use for a subject today, it don't matter to me. Like, I mean, it don't matter to me. <laughs> uh, that's our subject for today. Um, it don't matter to me. Not it doesn't. It don't matter to me. Um, so I want to, of course, put everything into context to to show you these words are the first of the beginning of his last words <laughs> um, as, as Jesus on earth uh, before his crucifixion. Um, this Friday, many of you will celebrate with your churches and your ministries and other churches and other ministries. You may celebrate um, Good Friday. Um, and Good Friday is where a lot of ministers will do what they call the seven last words of Jesus. They are not the seven last words that he spoke. They are the seven last statements that Jesus made while he was dying on the cross. We know they're not his seven last words on this earth because in order for Easter to be Easter, he had to get up from the grave and return and show his disciples, listen, I did what I said I was going to do. I told you that I would lay down my life and then I would raise my life back up again. And so you remember he came back to earth to show them his nail scarred hands. And so he spoke when he came back to see his disciples. So these this Friday, Good Friday, are not the seven last words of Jesus before he ascended into heaven. These are the last seven statements of Jesus while he was dying on the cross for our wrongdoing. Okay. But today I want to talk about his first last statement, his first, however you want, <laughs> I don't even really know how to describe it, but it's his first statement marching to his death. And what we find in, recorded in the Gospels is, uh, you know, Jesus tells his disciples, hey, there is a, a donkey that has not been ridden yet. And I need you to go and get that donkey. And that's what I'm going to ride um, into Jerusalem on. Um, Palm Sunday um, is so important. And we put more focus on the palm branches and Hosanna. Um, but our focus really on Palm Sunday should be on his first statement as he's riding into Jerusalem. That's where we should be excited about Palm Sunday, right? Because he's riding in 
and these jealous Pharisees, what happens is the disciples and other people there, they begin putting their cloaks and these branches, uh, they put the cloaks on the, on the donkey, they lay them on the road and they put palm branches um, on the road to him to ride along and that was customary. It was not anything new. It's something that they had done for kings prior to the king of kings, right? The difference in Jesus is that he didn't ride in on a horse. He, a horseman, I'm, I'm ready for battle. I'm ready for war. He rode in on a donkey. And that donkey symbolized peace. I'm coming in peace. I'm coming in love. I'm coming as a lamb ready for the slaughter. I'm coming to lay my life down because everything, nothing else is going to work. I'm the only way for you all to be saved. And so he came in the king of all kings, not on a horse ready to defeat the devil and to defeat death. He came in in peace knowing that he would defeat death. <laughs> and as he was going, the problem is when we celebrate them shouting Hosanna, there's a problem in that. And I know this probably goes against um, a lot of what you may know or have heard in the past. There's nothing wrong with Hosanna based on your heart. So my heart, if I say Hosanna, Hosanna, I'm saying Savior, Savior of the whole world. Um, savior, not just of these physical things on this earth, but Savior as I wrestle not against flesh and blood. Things that I battle are spiritual battles, and He is my Savior. And so when I shout Hosanna, and I am excited about Hosanna, I am calling Him my Savior, the one who died on the cross, and the one who got up, and the one who promised me that He was coming back for me. So when I say Hosanna, that's who I'm praising. In this crowd, you have some just like me. They're disciples. They're saying, Hosanna. Hosanna, you came to save the whole world. You're, you're him. You're the savior. You're the king. You're the king, the king of kings, and the Lord of lords. But also within that crowd, some were shouting, Hosanna, because they thought he was there to rescue them physically. They weren't thinking heaven. They were thinking earth. <laughs> they were thinking, you came to, you know, destroy the Roman Empire. You're like, you came to get us, to save us. And so their Hosanna was not the same thing as the disciples' Hosanna. My first question to you is when you shout Hosanna, <laughs> are you worshiping and praising him to get you out of debt, out of relationship, out of problems? Are you worshiping him because he already won the victory and he's going to come back for you? And that you, the only way that you get into heaven is because of what he did on the cross. Why do you shout and praise and sing Hosanna? The ones who shouted Hosanna like me that knew why they were shouting Hosanna still. It says Peter denied him three times. He still at the end was like, uh, I don't know him. <laughs> Never seen the man. <laughs> But those who didn't really fully understand why they were shouting Hosanna, that's why within a week, they were, those same people were shouting, crucify him. They didn't understand. He didn't come to save you from the Romans. He came to save you from the devil, <laughs> from someone much bigger than that. And so he's riding in and these Pharisees, these Pharisees are scholars. Probably people who are watching me now going, she ain't been to a day of seminary. She don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> but that's what they were. They were critics, basically. I mean, they were people who studied scripture. They knew scripture. They knew it backward and forward. They tried to keep the law. They tried to keep the rules. Like, they knew everything. They were well-versed. They were, I mean, like, they know this stuff. And here Jesus comes on a donkey. I mean, just coming in. And these people would begin to praise him. And it makes them jealous. And they say, hey, listen, hey. Um, they need to quit doing that. You about to get everybody in trouble. They need to quit shouting Hosanna. Jesus, it don't matter to me. I mean, <laughs> okay. <laughs> we got two choices here. <laughs> two. They can keep shouting Hosanna, right? Or the rocks can do it. It don't matter. It... <laughs> It, what's not going to happen <laughs> today i'm going to get praise today i'm going to be worshiped today that's so important because if you read back in scripture 
Jesus wasn't always going towards the crowds. He was like, shh, don't tell him I healed you. Shh, go quietly. Don't, don't go make a big deal about it. A couple of times when the disciples were like, hey, Jesus, we're going over here. He goes, I can't go with you yet. They're like, why? What are you afraid of? He's like, because they're going to kill me. <laughs> oh, well, well, Jesus, they're going to kill you anyway. But, but his point was, it's not my time yet. It's not time. Um, and, you know, we, we've, we've heard Jesus say that before, um, his very first miracle. And this shows you that he was completely human. Um, I'm going to show you how he knows everything that we go through, like everything we go through. His mom says, Jesus, they don't have any more wine at this wedding. And he said, woman. Now, <laughs> who are you calling woman? <laughs> Where's mother or mommy <laughs> or ma'am? <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> He said, woman, <laughs> um, see, y'all know that you can't, okay. Y'all know you can't just say, you say woman to you. Try to try to have your mama say something to you and you say woman and see what happens. <laughs> he said, woman, it's not my time yet. She said, servants, <laughs> I'm not even business saying nothing to you, Jesus servants, go get them pots. And then whatever he say, do, do that. And Jesus was obedient to his mother. Young people, listen. He, was, he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He actually created Mary. <laughs> he created his mother, though he was in her womb. And she had to tell him what to do. He was obedient. So listen to your parents. Do what they say. Jesus understands. This was important though, because for the first time, Jesus is mounting onto this animal and publicly, publicly displaying who he is. Yes, now it's time for me to declare that I am the son of God. Now, this scripture, what a lot of people say is a rock. No, it's, it's not an object that can live and breathe and move. And therefore, Jesus was being poetic. He was trying to make a point that just to say, well, it's easier for me to tell the rocks to say something than it is for me to calm the crowd. That's what a lot of people have interpreted it to be because they're like, <laughs> a rock doesn't have a mouth and a rock cannot speak English or Hebrew or, um, you know, all those languages, Greek, none of them, none of the languages of that time. And so therefore he wasn't really saying the rocks will cry out. Uh... I honestly, and I'm sorry, I beg to differ. Um, I do think Jesus probably was saying, well, it doesn't matter to me, whichever. It's probably gonna make you more angry and prove my point more if the rocks say something. So it's up to you, <laughs> which do you prefer? <laughs> well, Lee, why in the world <laughs> would you think that? Because of Numbers chapter 22. Um, before I get to Numbers 22, let me just tell you. Um, Mary got pregnant without a man. That's impossible. It is. It's impossible. Sorry, young people. That's impossible. <laughs> um, so when you tell me a rock can't cry out, I would tell you that a woman cannot get pregnant without a man. If you remember in the beginning, all God did was spoke, let there be light. And guess what? It chased away the darkness. So a rock crying out doesn't seem too difficult. When the children of Israel were needing to cross the Red Sea, then the waves bowed down to God and they moved out of the way and dry and ground became dry instead of wet so they could pass through. So could a rock speak out? I think so. 
When the children of Israel were in the desert and they were hungry and Moses said, hey, listen, he's going to give us manna from heaven. I'm talking about bread. Bread will fall out of the sky. I think a rock might be able to talk. When you tell me a bush is on fire and you can hear the voice of God coming from the bush, I think that a rock might be able <laughs> to cry out. When you tell me that Jesus was on board a boat with disciples and a storm came and they panicked. See, the storm didn't wake up Jesus that day. He was sleeping like a baby, but the storm was bothering the disciples. And when Jesus woke up, he said, what is wrong with y'all? Don't you see this storm? Don't you care that we die? He did not speak to those disciples. Well, he asked them, you know, you have a little faith, but you know what he said? He said, peace, be still. Do you know what he was talking to? <laughs> he was talking to something we can't even see. He was talking to the wind and it stopped. He was talking to a storm and it stopped. So to tell me that a rock can't speak out, it's kind of difficult to believe. Numbers 22 kind of solidifies it for me. In Numbers 22, there are two characters and if I start mixing their names around, um, then I will correct it on screen, but, but just bear with him. So you have this, um, guy who does divination. I'm assuming that's how you pronounce it. Um, where he can, uh, curse things, bless things. And he, his name was Balaam and he, um, believed in God. He served God. He spoke to God. He asked God for everything. He, he, he was, he's, he's good. He loves God. You have the son of this king, and I think the king's name is Zippor or Zippor. Zippor. I don't know. doesn't matter to me. <laughs> but the son's name is Balak. When the Israelites had defeated the Amorites and um, were camping by the Jordan River close to Jericho, uh, the Moabites panicked. They was like, uh, excuse me, do y'all know what those Israelites can do? Remember the Israelites again, remember children of Israel. So that's Jacob's people. The children of Israel are powerful. They have done many wonderful things and they have just defeated the Amorites. We're in trouble. And so Balak does what he believes to be the best thing the only way to defeat them we can't defeat them with our army we cannot defeat them with uh, swords and things like that so i tell you what let me take some messengers and he goes and he tells balaam he tells messengers to tell balaam hey y'all go tell balaam to to put a curse on because whoever he blesses is blessed and whoever he curses they are cursed so go tell balaam remember balaam serves god God has chosen the children of Israel to be blessed and to prosper. So now you're telling Balaam to go against the Israelites. So you're telling God to go against God, really, in essence. So they go down and Balaam goes, you want me to do what? To curse him? Okay, um, let me do this. Let me talk to God first. And after I talk to God, whatever he tells me to do, that's what I'll do. If he tells me to curse him, absolutely. He goes to sleep that night. He goes back to the messengers and say, God said, absolutely not. Those are my people. Those are chosen people. You cannot put a curse on them. The messengers go back and say, um, hey, uh, Balak, he said, no, he cannot go against God. And Balak goes, no, 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 go tell him. I'll give him anything. I will give him anything. Like he doesn't have to worry about it. He will be blessed forevermore. And they come back and they say, hey, um, Balak, wants this wants to see you and he's going to give you anything he goes uh let me talk to god about that because he told me no so let me talk to him again and god says okay fine forget it whatever just go but you can only do what i tell you to do now i figured god was mad ahead of time but then the bible says god was angry and he started on he starts on his way so here balaam the one who can bless and curse balaam is now headed to balak to see what this dude wants. After God told him no, he asked God again. God said, okay, you can go, but only do what I say. 
And here's what makes me believe this rock can cry out. So Balaam is on his way to Balak and on his way, an angel of the Lord is in the road and pulls out a sword and the donkey runs into the field. Well, Balaam gets mad and beats this donkey, like beats him. The donkey gets back on the road. The angel appears again. And this time he appears like with this wall thing, I think. And the donkey's like pressing up against the wall, you know, trying to go left or right, but he's scared. And the man beats him again because he doesn't move forward. Then the angel makes it to where the only way this don the only thing the donkey can do is lay down the third time. And the third time he beats the donkey. After the third time, the Bible, what I believe. Now, if you believe the Bible, you got to believe the whole thing. You can't believe parts of it. The Bible says that God opened the donkey's mouth. Yeah, it says it. Numbers 22. Two and <laughs> two. Look it up for yourself. And the donkey begins to talk. Real words, not hee-haw, hee-haw, but real words. And the donkey says, why, why are you beating me? And he's like, because you didn't do what I said. He goes, haven't I always been your donkey? Have I ever done this to you before? And he says, no. And then God opens his eyes and he sees the angel. And he's like, ah. Oh. If a donkey can talk, if bread can fall out of heaven, if a virgin can get pregnant, if... If I was in Noah's day and you tell me that war is just all of a sudden going to just come out the sky, I mean, <laughs> you know, if you can strike a rock and water comes out of a bush, can talk. If a wind, if a wind can stop because you told it to stop and to be still, I'm pretty sure Jesus wasn't saying poetry. <laughs> I'm sure he was saying, if you don't praise me, if you don't let these praise me, then the rocks will cry, I'm going to get praise today. Today, I am making my entry. I am marching in to defeat death. And today is day one. It's one of the, one of the seven last statements of Jesus while he was dying on the cross was, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. In the beginning, He's telling them, it don't matter to me. It don't matter to me who praises me, but I'm going to get praise. If we take the mindset of these scholars and of people who are interpreting this as poetry, then we are guilty of limiting the power of God. And I'm not going to do that. I believe that if God wanted a rock to cry out, Hosanna, that he could do it. And there are some rocks in your life. There are things in your life that seem unmovable. There are things in your life that seem too hard for God. There are things in your life that just seem poetic. There are things in your life where you feel you are not worthy. There are things in your life where it just feels like this is it. I'm stuck. But we serve a God who can do anything. And when he marched in there and said, if these don't praise me, he was declaring, I am God. I created all things. I am the King of kings and I am the Lord of lords. And today, today I am declaring that nothing is too hard for me. Today, there is nothing that is impossible for me. So yes, I believe that if those people had stopped praising God, then God was able in the form and the presence and the, the manner of Jesus to make that rock cry out, all of those rocks to cry out. And when he told that fig tree, ah, you're not producing. And it died. It did so at the command of Jesus. So don't tell me in your life there are things that are too difficult or too hard for God. 
He can do anything. And we have to start remembering on Palm Sunday. Yes, Hosanna, you are our Savior. But more than that, we have to celebrate what he said rather than what the people said. Because not everybody understood what they were saying that day. But Jesus knew exactly what he was saying that day. And he said, if these don't, it don't matter to me. <laughs> take, your, take your choice. But I'm going to get glory out of this. And I'm going to be worshipped out of this. I'm going to get praise out of this. That's why sometimes people say, hey, if you're not going to do it, God can use someone else to do it. Nothing is too hard for God. Nothing is too difficult. And Palm Sunday is our reminder of who was about to die on the cross. He wanted us to fully understand that day who was going to give his life, the one who could make a rock cry out in our place. He wanted us to fully understand that he was laying his life down, that he was in fact who he said he was. That's the important thing about Palm Sunday, not what we said waving palm branches, but what he said, riding in in peace. Jesus like, it don't matter to me. Well, well <laughs> you tell me, <laughs> whichever way. <laughs> but if these rocks cry out, you're going to have a bigger problem on your hands trying to explain to them <laughs> that I'm not who I say I am. <laughs> Y'all, there's nothing too hard for God. And we're living in a day and time where it seems like everything is too hard. I can't do everything. I can't answer the phone all the time. I can't answer my text all the time. I can't make everyone feel better. I can't give you peace. I can't give you enough food. I can't pay all of your bills. I can't, you, you give me a list of things to do. I can't do them all and I certainly cannot do them all at the same time, but I know someone who can. Y'all, you gotta give it over to God. That's why it's a triumphal entry. He was letting us know who was marching towards his own death and resurrection? The first last words, the first beginning last words of Jesus. If these don't, then the rocks will cry out <laughs> in praise. <laughs> he can do it. Whatever it is, whatever it is you're going through, I promise you, he is the same. He can handle it. Just turn it over to God. This Palm Sunday, make that decision. Make the decision that you believe that when he came in on Palm Sunday, that he in fact could do anything. That he was the King of Kings and that he is, not was, is the Lord of Lords and that there's nothing too hard for him. That's what Palm Sunday is really about. Him making a declaration. If you don't know who Jesus is, or if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, not you just believe that he's real, but you have made a decision to obey him and to serve him and to put others before yourself. If you've made, if you would like to make that decision, it's very easy. You just admit that you are a sinner and believe that God loved you so much that he sent his only son to die for your wrongdoing. You can go online to knowwallsnowwhat.com and if you go all the way down to the best decision ever made, you can follow the link and it will help you walk through uh, your journey, your salvation journey, um, especially while we're in quarantine. And you can always email me and Reverend Melissa at knowwallsnowwhat at gmail.com and we'll be happy to pray with you and for you. If all hearts and minds are clear, would you please bow your head. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you right now saying thank you so much. Thank you, God, that there is nothing too hard for you. Thank you that you asked us to cast our cares upon you because you care for us. Thank you that you're able. Thank you that there is nothing that you can't do. And you can bless us all at the same time. And you can bring us all out at the same time. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you, God, that that day Jesus declared that he was going to finish what you started in him. Thank you for being God. Thank you in advance for what you did on the cross, Jesus. We don't even have to make it to Easter Sunday just to say thank you for dying on the cross and for getting up on the third day. 
God, right now, I ask that you would heal all of those who are brokenhearted. Heal all of those who are battling depression and low self-esteem, God. I ask that you would bless marriages and homes, God. Do a new thing in, in their lives. God, we are only asking you because we believe and know that you are able to do it. These and all other blessings we ask in your precious son, Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, happy Palm Sunday to you. Um, remember, it don't matter, you know. <laughs> God is going to get the glory out of our lives anyway. Thank you so much for joining us today in uh, morning service. And next week is Easter Sunday where we will celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I love you all so much. See you next week. Bye-bye.